Good morning, afternoon, and good evening to anyone joining us today. Uh, my name is Kevin Lee, and on behalf of the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar titled The Science Behind ITSI Testing Methods. We would like to thank our very generous sponsors who allow the work of IDBSI to continue and who support implementation around the world. Some quick housekeeping before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. All participants who join us today are in listen-only mode, which means that panelists won't hear or see us and the microphone and video will remain off. However, if you do have any questions, you can submit them throughout the presentation. To do so, you can use the questions function in the control panel, which should be on the right-hand side of your window. The panelists will try and address these questions at the end of the presentation, where we'll have a Q&A period. ITSI does not currently offer continuing education units, but in the upcoming days, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to anyone attending this session. Uh, that's it for housekeeping. Today, we have in our presentation, Dr. Ben Hansen. Uh, Dr. Ben Hansen is a senior lecturer in engineering at University College London. In addition, Dr. Hansen also sits on the IDDSI Global Board. And we'll also have today with us Peter Lamb, co-chair of IDDSI. Peter Lam is a registered dietitian and credentialed food service executive in Vancouver, BC, Canada. Now, everyone, please enjoy this presentation, which is about to start. And Dr. Hansen, we're so thrilled to have you, and I will now turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin, and hello and welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to this webinar presentation of the science behind ITSI. So as Kevin said, um, if you're watching live, there'll be time afterwards for um, questions and answers. So do feel free to pose those at any point. Um, so yeah, as Kevin said, I'm uh, a board member of ITSI. I have been since 2012. It's um, a little unbelievable. I'm also an associate professor at University College London. That's my main job, where I research the biomechanics of swallowing in particular and dysphagia. I'm also an independent consultant to the food and drink industry. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on the details, the science, um, and also the stories behind the measurements which define the IDSI levels. So I'm going to assume that you're already familiar with the IDSI framework and that you've seen www.idsi.org. That website um, hosts the full framework documents the technical and evidence documents. And as well as that, it has cons consumer handouts, um, posters, and information in a wide variety of levels of detail. Um, as Kevin said, we are supported today by a number of generous commercial sponsors. They support the webinar and the office costs, but um, I can make it clear that while they uh, cover these operating costs, um, we draw no salary, uh, no fees, and the sponsors have no influence in the operation of IDSI and no input to content of any of our documents. So IDSI was created for all ages and all care settings and all cultures around the world. So right from the start of this presentation, I wanted to make sure um, that uh, the measurements are accessible to the widest population as possible including individuals with dysphagia and the carers and healthcare professionals who are looking after them. And that sets the, the fundamental tone for the language and the definitions that ITSI chose. Our challenge was to bring together all of the existing clinical and technical details of physiology, food science and texture modified diets that was available at the time to come up with definitions that were relevant to all the people you see on screen for day-to-day -day use across the globe. In order for any of that science to be of any use, it needs to get out of the lab. So that's what this presentation is all about, getting that science out there. How can we get measurements in the real world done by real people, not him? Well, here's an easy example of a measurement that anyone can do, the volume of liquid. It's one dimensional, 
one number can characterize everything about it. The challenge is that when we get to texture modification, it's um, as Julie Chiquero beautifully put it, how thick is thick? But more importantly, what do we mean by thick? What do we actually want to measure? So those are the questions that I'm going to try and answer in this presentation. And maybe we can discuss that at the end of the presentation too. So this is the story of how IDSI came up with the specific measurements in the framework document. I'm also going to give you a quick glimpse at the end of the presentation at some of the new science which has grown out of IDSI. So the process of um, creating the IDSI framework um, involved a multidisciplinary international board. Um, we've based it on scientific research and we've created scientific research through the process. And we followed international best practice um, provided by the World Health Organization and other organizations about how to go about creating these guidelines. So that kind of sets the, the framework for this story. Back in 2013, the um, multidisciplinary group was created and we identified clinical issues. We involved consumers uh, at that point and before, and we performed a systematic review um, and appraisal of the literature, which was published in the journal Dysphagia. We consulted um, beyond the group and in, have involved uh, industry and um, commercial and clinical uh, stakeholders in that, as well as patient advocacy groups. And uh, we drafted a framework and sent that out for consultation. And perhaps um, those of you listening were uh, some of the respondents, I think um, three and a half thousand respondents for one of our surveys, and I think over 7,000 for one of the other surveys um, to provide feedback to IDSI on those um, framework documents. So this was the birthplace of IDSI. As I said, I'd like to give you some of the, the stories behind it. Um, this was a Vancouver Airport Hotel, and um, I don't remember anything of the marina around it or the beautiful mountains in the distance, but I do remember a lot of time and debate around the table with all sorts of texture modified foods and drinks. Okay, so the focus of this, as well as saying how thick is thick, is really about what are we trying to measure. And I'd like to, I, I always include this sort of slide in my presentations. Um, real swallowing, that's what this is all about. Um, I particularly um, am interested in the interaction going on here. That relates to my uh, flavor of engineering, actually, as it happens. Control engineering, where you're sensing motion, controlling motion, and that's interacting um, with the outside world. And that's what's going on through swallowing. We are sensing the position of a bolus in a healthy case um, and controlling the motion and the deformation of that bolus so that hopefully we have a healthy swallow process. So all of this depends on um, our sensation and our motor control. And the third piece of the puzzle is the bolus itself. Now this doesn't have any um, active parts, but it does have a, a response to the pressures acting on it. The material properties of the bolus are the one thing that we can control uh, externally. And that gives us some influence over the sensations that are produced by the bolus, as well as how it moves and flows and responds um, as a result of the pressures that are acting on it. Right, so what actually goes on in the mouth? That's the challenge. Um, Video fluoroscopy gives us a, a 2D planar image, as you saw there. Um, it doesn't then really capture what's going on inside the bolus, how it's flowing and deforming though. Ultrasound gives us um, a little bit more detail there, but it's very blurry, low resolution. Um, and that, as well as um, pressure sensing in the mouth, a, a little bit invasive. Um, so I hesitate before saying invasive, but they're certainly noticeable. Um, when you have these instruments applied. And that may well affect the swallowing process too. So it's very difficult to capture at a good enough resolution um, what that relationship between pressure and flow is in the mouth. And remember, that's what texture modification is all about. That's what we're trying to measure. 
In other fields of biomedical engineering, um, we throw computer simulations at the problem. But with swallowing, that's unusually difficult, actually. Partly because you have this um, partly conscious and partly unconscious control of muscles and muscle tone. Um, you have a very complicated anatomy, but also it's the fluid, which itself is not a straightforward, simple uh, material to characterize. And we're going to delve into more details of that later. So as a, a complement to those techniques, people have looked at um, mechanical simulations. And here we have um, the SWOL e a uh, semi-robotic simulator of uh, the pharynx, part of the swallowing process. The purpose of this is to give us better control of um, measuring the fluid flow through something that's um, relatively physiologically um, realistic in shape. But obviously you're not having any sensation or control going on there. It's just a semi-realistic movement. The Gothenburg throat is very similar with excellent ability to measure uh, pressure and flow, but is a, a simplified model. At UCL, we have our own simplified model. Um, we're focusing on the oral stage of swallowing. We have a, a soft tongue compressing a bolus against a hard palate, and we're measuring the pressures involved in that. The benefit of having see-through sides here, as well as being able to show nice videos, is that we can see inside the fluid. So these simulators give you better um, perception inside the fluid mechanics, but obviously they're lacking in that in vivo reality. So IDSI's challenge, and the challenge of clinicians, I suppose, is to is to try to coalesce all of these different fields into what could be a, a meaningful strategy for helping people with dysphagia through texture modification. It's quite difficult. Um, won't really focus in on this too much, but we have the ability also to sense pressure within the mouth. I think I'll describe that a little bit later on. So as well as the um, mechanical evidence, we had clinical evidence. Um, and this was the result of IDSI's uh, systematic review. Um, very little clinical evidence specifically linking fluid textures to clinical outcomes of swallowing. We did find some evidence that thickened liquids were beneficial for people who had difficulty or who would aspirate thin liquids. And we also found trends that liquids could be too thick, um, where residue began to accumulate and drinks would become less appealing, which is a significant problem because dehydration is the start of a downward spiral. Um, the, the problem, apart from the, the paucity, the sparsity of this um, evidence, was that it was not quantified. There weren't, um, there weren't practical, useful measures of fluid consistencies around at the time. So um, it was very tricky to um, develop um, specific targets to aim for. So what I'm going to do is have a look through this um, ITSI framework that we came up with, and I hope um, everybody on the call today is familiar with this framework. Um, one of the key aspects was that it was a continuum. So we have um, a flow through from thin drinks to thickened drinks through to what you might call thin or highly processed foods to increasing texture and complexity. There's an overlap there because we wanted to avoid the um, somewhat philosophical or certainly subjective distinction between foods and drinks, particularly for pureed um, fruits and vegetables. So I'm going to start on the liquid side where um, we looked at um, defining these boundaries. Um, as I've said, there wasn't clinical evidence that would uh, illustrate clear boundaries um, in terms of any measurement, but we looked at what measurements there were. We found that some of the international standards that were pre-existing used a measure of viscosity, and we could understand the reasons for that. It's um, appealingly numerical. It's uh, you know factual. However, 
Does anybody on the call have a, a viscometer or a rheometer? Um, does anyone have one in their kitchen downstairs? Um, you can answer that later. Even I don't. <laughs> um, more importantly than the lack of accessibility of that viscometry measure is that viscometry doesn't apply very well to foods and drinks. And I'm going to cover that in a bit more detail later. But there are all sorts of challenges here um, in using viscosity. One of the key challenges, as I say, that viscosity as itself doesn't um, capture in one measurement everything about a, a fluid's characteristics that are relevant for swallowing. We saw some more detailed studies which um, captured other aspects of a fluid's flow behavior. Now, rheology is the full study of a material's um, response to pressures acting on it. And um, there were plenty of studies of that. Again, they were limited in their um, ability to be used practically. So ITSI's challenge at this point was to create a practical tool that could um, rely on all of this evidence, um, but was also, um, as I say, practical, affordable, and usable um, for all users. So let's have a look um, just for a moment at the viscosity itself in more detail. And here we have uh, an excerpt from a separate video I've done, uh, which is on YouTube about um, viscosity. Um, I have a channel on there and I have slightly fewer than several million subscribers. Anyway, so um, viscosity, I think we might all be aware, relates to fluid flow and sort of thickness of fluids. Here's a nice example of honey, which we might say has a higher viscosity than water. What about ketchup? That's also got a viscosity because you can squeeze it and deform it and swallow it. But um, my colleague, uh, Professor Steele there, is shaking that bottle of ketchup and nothing's coming out. It's also, as well as viscosity, got a yield stress, which stops any flow. But that doesn't mean that it's a solid, because you can quite easily uh, consume it or squidge it around. And if you give it a good shake, um, it'll come out. If we have time, um, my favorite poem, if you do not shake the bottle, none will come. And then a lot. Um, moving on to dysphagia, we have a couple of examples of texture modified products for the management of dysphagia. We have a gum thickened liquid and an oral nutritional supplement. Now, both of these are thick, but they're thick in different ways. And I hope I'm conveying the um, impression that one number is not going to be sufficient to describe the differences between them. Um, so, why I'm playing with Play-Doh is to illustrate how viscosity works. You can take a material and deform it in a number of different ways. Compression, extension, torsion is another way. And can you see these are all separate ways of changing the shape? Well, in fluids, the dominant um, mode of deformation is not really either of those but actually shear, and you may have heard shear rate um, mentioned with relevance to viscosity. In fluid, if you were to peer inside it, you'd see parts of the fluid flowing against each other or over each other in the direction of flow. Now, these are not separate layers, um, but they're just different elements of the fluid. And if we were to highlight one particular element and look at how it's deformed, it's not compressing, extending, or twisting, it's being sheared. And that's something that you can also measure quantitatively. Shear rate is how fast that's happening. And, uh, and with relevance to swallowing, we get um, this shear occurring anywhere fluid is flowing between surfaces. So this could be between the tongue and the palate, or it could be in a drinking straw. The key point is that as you observe the center of the flow there, that square is not changing shape. So shear rate in the middle is zero because the fluid's not moving relative to itself, whereas at the wall, the shear rate is maximum. So viscosity captures um, a measure of the fluid's response to shear, but only at a certain shear rate. And if we want to characterize swallowing or drinking, 
we're going to need to test at a load of different shear rates, including zero. Now let's um, get back to viscosity. Um, if you uh, just sort of at high level imagine three pipes with three different liquids coming out, one's flowing faster than the others. We have um, conceptually C with a higher viscosity than A. What does that mean in terms of a graph? And I hope you can um, tolerate this at this time of day, wherever you are. Viscosity is defined as a basis of power fluid flows, what its shear rate is in response to the stress acting on it. Now those three liquids had the same shear stress acting on them. They were on the same plane. So we've got um, a horizontal line with C, B and A on, on it. A is flowing faster at a higher shear rate than C. And if you were to draw a line through those points, that gives you um, a relationship between shear stress and shear rate, and that's what's called viscosity. So a, a higher slope is a higher viscosity. How that's measured in a lab is that you take a, a small sample of liquid, um, typically about one milliliter or, or less, and squeeze it between two plates, rotate one of the plates, and that gives you a pure shear deformation, uh, which is very good for science, gives you very nice graphs, but it doesn't necessarily represent the soft tissues or the textures in somebody's mouth. Um, a Newtonian case is that straight line. Um, you may have heard of Newton being quite kind of famous for very general, broad governing rules that govern the flow of the universe, but when it comes to um, the more specific nitty gritty, Newtonian mechanics falls down. I and mean, it falls down when you start to look at quantum mechanics. And it also falls down when you start to look at foods and drinks. So Newtonian liquids would be things like water, honey, and oils. And these all continually flow, but they're not the sorts of things that we um, consume a great deal of. Non Newtonian sounds a bit subversive or um, faulty or incorrect, but actually most of the foods and drinks that we consume um, as healthy individuals or dysphagic are non-Newtonian. And that means that instead of that straight line relationship between sheer stress and rate, they have a, a curved relationship, non-linear. So instead of viscosity, that goes out the window because this viscosity, the slope of this graph isn't constant we have an apparent viscosity, which at um, a condition of low shear rate, looking at the bottom of the graph here, has an apparently high viscosity. So that's that yogurt on a fork, looks almost like a solid. But how can that be um, swallowed? Well, you just apply a little bit more stress to it, um, more than gravity, put it in your mouth and squeeze it, and then the apparent viscosity is much lower. And that's, why a, a yogurt or a texture modified drink would be easy to manage in the mouth and easy to swallow as well. So this is not something that's at fault and neither is it the material changing into a different material as you swallow it. That curve describes the material's properties. And here we have um, an example of that in the real world, um, a texture modified oral nutritional supplement, pudding thick, and it would happily sit on that spoon all afternoon but when you put it in your mouth and apply a bit of sheer stress, you can swallow it. So the challenge, let's go back to that, um, those idzy definitions, is how to capture all of this. And as well as that curved nonlinear relationship of viscosity, fluids tend to have other bizarre properties. This is a, a gum thickened liquid that has a clear elasticity. It's oscillating. So when, we, when idzy looked at ways of assessing thickness, which I'm using instead of viscosity, and I'm using that, um, I think, very appropriately. We have a, um, a spectrum. From the top, we have the, the least scientific, you might think, the most subjective verbal descriptions, but that's what we relied upon until ITZY came along. You have then um, standardized protocols swirling in a cup, or um, practical tools in the middle. And that's where ITZY really aimed. Um, we also as you've seen, based our um, measurements on um, rather more complex lab-based tools. But 
as you can see, viscosity was decided to be too simplistic to describe foods and drinks. Um, we did some studies, this was, gosh, was that 2010? Um, where we found the viscosity changing by um, two or more orders of magnitude. So the viscosity when it's swallowed um, would be maybe a hundred or, or a thousand times less than the apparent viscosity if the fluid was sitting on a plate. One isolated measure of viscosity won't capture it. So an important um, factor in IDSI's decision was that the methods needed to be accessible and valid, not accessibility versus validity. The measurements needed to represent in vivo flow. So not just sitting on a plate, um, the Bostwick consistometer and line spread test are practical tools. Um, Bostwick's um, still a few hundred dollars, so it's um, still, we actually kind of rejected it on the basis of cost as well, but kind of more fundamentally, more scientifically, they measure slump rather than the high, um, high rates of shear that would get involved in swallowing. Shear and extension too. Um, so we wanted to capture that. And we came across um, a funnel being used in the food and drink industry to measure viscosity, um, typically of dairy products, and started to investigate that. And we came up with our own geometry of funnel, which uses, as you're probably familiar with now, a 10 milliliter syringe. Now look at the bottom of that syringe and you see a funnel. But more than that, it's a funnel with a scale attached to it. And the 10 milliliters was chosen out of all of the syringes that you can get around the world to give us a really nice mapping from thin liquids like water up to the very thickest liquids that would be used in dysphagia management. And that spans quite nicely across that 10 point scale. We've chosen to let it flow for 10 seconds, which again was a nice map to those um, fluids that were already in use. And the 10 milliliters there um, were seen as a, um, a suitable sample size. Other tools like a larger funnel or the Bostwick consistometer would use maybe 70 or 200 milliliters of fluid. Um, and that was too much if you want to test somebody's drink, testing it. Um, taking 200 milliliters of it, they're gonna have nothing left. So we wanted to have something where you could test and discard that so that um, the food safety issues were much, were much less. The nozzle of the syringe gives us another important measurement tool in that it's um, 1.8 millimeters across, which is um, a good indicator of particle size. Now in those itsy fluid um, categories, we want to, um, we want to limit them to, to smooth textures without particles, larger than that sort of size, and you're gonna notice it on the tongue and palate, and that's gonna affect the way that you swallow. So having the nozzle size like that gives us a way to um, identify whether there are particles in that. They will then block the um, nozzle, and you'll notice that as a stuttering or a stopping of the flow. So there are many different reasons that we ended up choosing that syringe, as well as the fact that it gives us um, the right characteristics of flow. Quick comparison, and these videos are also on YouTube. Um, I'd highly recommend those two. This is on IDSI's channel. But just to illustrate the differences across those range of textures. And all of this done in 10 seconds. We came across other funnel measures, which took a couple of minutes. But um, we even still get people saying that 10 seconds takes too long. So, uh, you can't, you can't please everybody. Now, I mentioned the, um, the sheer, sheer rates going on through that, wanting to be representative of swallowing. And that was something that we studied in considerable detail. I have another YouTube video about this, and this is a paper peer reviewed in Annals of Biomedical Engineering, where I used quite a controlled mechanical um, experimental rig to test the fluid flow and measure that experimentally and um, used computer simulation to identify the shear stresses and the shear rates going on inside that syringe. Um, as well as giving us beautiful, pretty pictures, it allows us to compare that data against um, in vivo measurements of shear rates. And we found a good mapping. We found that the shear rates through the syringe do span from zero up to the highest uh, rates of shear that you would see during swallowing. 
and that that varies depending on the consistency of the liquid in it, just as it would in a physiological swallow. We can study that also in uh, our simulator at UCL, and that confirmed that data. Now, I want to also um, advertise or remind us all to um, use the correct syringe for doing the syringe test. The result is entirely dependent on the geometry of the syringe, so it's important that that's right, and the correct syrin syringes are specified on the IDSI website. You might also notice on that picture an IDSI funnel, which is being produced, I am promised, as we speak um, at long last. That has the exact same dimensions as the syringes that IDSI is recommending at the moment, um, but a number of other advantages. What I also want to mention, though, is that um, there have been a lot of requests for saying, well, we don't um, have a supply of these correct syringes. Can we use another one and create a currency conversion or a mapping between the two? If we use a larger syringe, will that just flow faster? Well, unfortunately, because the fluids that we use are non-linear, non-Newtonian, then that mapping is also non-linear. And it's going to vary depending on whether you're measuring gum thickened liquids or nutritional supplements or soups. So it's not like Fahrenheit to Celsius where there's a linear mapping. Now, if we go back to our spectrum of methods for assessing thickness and Idzi picking a midpoint, it, you might ask, are we sacrificing accuracy for the sake of convenience and cost? And um, having myself having a great deal of experience at all of these measures, including a rheometer, um, I can confirm that the gold standard rheometer, uh, when we calibrate those, we use very expensive test fluids, which are guaranteed in their viscosity at plus or minus 5%. So that gold standard, um, costing tens of thousands of dollars, is accurate to plus or minus 5%. If you compare that to the syringe, um, plus or minus 5% on the syringe scale is actually very easy to achieve in practice. Um, I get a lot better accuracy than that most often. So I'm quite happy with my 10 or 20 cents of plastic. I'm also happy with the practicalities of running that. Um, thickened liquids are not homogeneous and rheometers can be very fussy sometimes. So the syringe actually works a lot better with real world food, foods and drinks. Also like to contextualize um, other sources of variability, particularly if you're making up thickened drinks. The variability in the scoop volume and the liquid volume, depending on how that's measured, that can be very significant. When I'm doing tests, I use digital precision scales to weigh the mass of powder that I'm using. Um, I don't imagine anybody else does that in practice though. Scooping is fine, but um, unless you're leveling off the top of the scoop, like people do with infant formula, um, you're gonna get quite a large amount of variability um, from person to person and scoop to scoop. So let's head back to um, the Itzy pyramid and I'm gonna to start to focus on the food measurements now. So when we looked at um, our systematic review, and uh, looking for evidence of specific measurements of food characteristics that were relevant to swallowing. We found even less evidence than we did for liquids, and this was a little bit disappointing. Um, we did find a sort of a trend that what was described as solid food or thick paste consistencies was associated with greater effort in processing those foods and in swallowing. Um, but we didn't find any clinical um, relationships. And in retrospect, that wasn't too surprising um, that we didn't find any uh, randomized controlled trials, because we imagined the process of doing that, um, feeding individuals who were um, dysphagic or in fragile states with a range of different foods, expecting some of them to cause a risk of choking, um, that sort of study is not gonna get through the ethics panel. And measuring outcomes um, is rather messy. So um, what we did instead was that we were able to look at autopsy data and identify characteristics of foods and drinks that um, had caused choking issues. So we based our measurements uh, partly upon that. 
right, let's focus in on some of those specific measurements. So working down the um, IDSI framework scale, the least modified is our level seven easy to chew, which is characterized um, by the term soft. Um, of course, what do we mean by soft itself as a word is, is not adequate. So um, we've looked to food science again. A texture analyzer is what's used in commercial kitchens and development labs to analyze food. And this is us literally, um, well, almost using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Again, several tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment to squash a banana. Not just squash a banana, though, you get a nice scientific graph out of it. And that captures the relationship, much as with um, rheometry, captures the relationship between the pressure that's applied and the deformation the flow of that banana. So what Idzi's challenge was here was to identify what was relevant, how we could best measure that in the lab, and then how we could develop a practical tool. So in terms of how we can measure it in the lab, um, we had access to some of these food science tools. Um, in terms of what's relevant, well, we considered um, the physiological rationale, and there's more details of that on our webpage, but really we wanted to relate um, breakdown of these um, particles um, of, uh, of food in mouths of people who maybe had limited dentition, maybe just gums, maybe limited strength. So those were the issues that we, we wanted to capture. We came up with this fork pressure test. So more details of that. Um, the texture analyzer in the lab has very expensive and well-controlled motors and force sensors that regulate the pressure being applied. The main challenge was how on earth to do that um, in a kitchen, and that was the target audience. Um, very difficult. We looked at weights, but even that we, felt, we thought was too complex and was maybe even risky, because you do need to apply a, a reasonably hard pressure. Um, we looked at asking people to press hard. But the variation in grip strength and hand strength was enormous, especially when you compare an individual with dysphagia maybe sarcopenia, to perhaps a, a care assistant who might have um, very big muscles. What we noticed though is that our thumbnails were blanching white as the blood pressure um, was exceeded by the pressure that we were applying and that squeezed the blood out. And it occurred to, the, to us that this was happening at um, roughly the same pressure. We measured it and it was about 17 kilopascals. Now happily enough that corresponds to the pressures um, measured between the tongue and the palate when swallowing soft foods. It's not a maximum isometric pressure, but it's something that would be convenient and comfortable to do many times. So that um, systolic blood pressure varies between people, but varies much less than their um, muscular strength or asking them to compress something uh, firmly or not. The prongs of the fork um, give us also the ability to visualize what's going on and give us um, a representation of the textures of teeth or even without teeth, the um, semi-bony surfaces of the gums. It also gives us the ability to visualize. And an important um, other characteristic, marshmallows. They're certainly soft, but also certainly a choking risk. We very easily plug a trachea just the way as a, a soft cork would plug a wine bottle. So it's important that we observe the sample squashing and not returning to its original shape. And all of this can be captured with that fork compression. So onto, um, as I mentioned, uh, choking risk. We looked at these um, evidence uh, articles of um, autopsy uh, choking incidences <clears throat> and looked at um, materials which caused, uh, caused um, choking fatalities. We found things like mashed potato and bread, which nobody would call that hard, certainly soft, but were able to plug a trachea. So for our next Glee um, modified level, we wanted to minimize that choking risk. And the only way that we could identify doing that was to limit the particle size so that the particles were small enough to pass through the trachea and not obstruct it. We looked at um, anatomical data 
and chose 15 millimeters as a balance between large enough to provide um, choice and flexibility for um, individuals and their um, kitchen staff, but also to provide that safety net, um, not blocking the airway. So that's where our soft and bite size level combines the test for softness with particle size. Um, moving down in the um, processing, and I, I have a gross out warning before the, the next slides, um, we're considering the process of um, chewing and forming a bolus from these larger particles. And for our next level, we wanted to consider what level uh, of processing gives us a texture that's comfortable and safe to swallow. And food oral processing gives us uh, studies where they're asking people, and look away if you're squeamish, to chew up food until they decide that it's ready to be swallowed and then spit it out. And they measured the material characteristics of what's going on there. So there are several publications um, and items of literature about this. And it's on that basis that we defined the next level and the next set of tests for minced and moist. Particle size of four millimeters, because that, what, that was what was the maximum to be um, tolerated as a, as a comfortable uh, swallow for something that's been chewed. Um, four millimeters happens uh, to be the, the typical separation between the prongs of a fork. So again, the kitchen measurement is all that we're needing to, um, to identify that. Um, and the particles should be soft too. So again, that's a, an important characteristic. Here we also have, um, as with soft and bite size, a differentiation between adults and children, just purely on the base of um, anatomy and size. So moving again downwards, um, we're now looking to level four, where we're removing um, any particles at all. Um, there is evidence that the way that you swallow depends on perception of um, texture. So um, the smoothest texture um, gives us some sort of comfort. And again, moving down that oral processing um, trajectory, forming a bolus, adding saliva, gets a cohesive bolus, which is easy to control on the tongue. That can be measured in the lab as well, but we looked at how we could characterize that um, experimentally in the kitchen. And again, our fork was a uh, very practical test. Testing the ability of a material to hold itself together, the prongs of the fork give you a, a bridge over which a material can span if it resists that um, force due to gravity pulling it through the prongs. So this is our test for cohesion. And the idea is that if a um, liquid or semi-solid can sit in a mound above those prongs of a fork and not flow through, then it's cohesive enough to form a bolus that won't spill off the tongue um, and potentially cause an aspiration risk. Adhesion is the flip side of that texture and again is measurable in the lab using a texture analyzer where instead of crushing the sample, you stick it to the two um, surfaces and pull them apart. Now that's much more tricky to measure in the kitchen. Um, but we started to really focus about what was the um, characteristic that we're trying to measure, rather than just what can we measure? What's the, the purpose of um, assessing adhesion? Stickiness is associated with residue, and that was really the thing that we wanted to identify. Um, you might remember here that previous descriptors of thickness of texture modified um, drinks looked at coatings on spoons um, as a judge of thickness. Um, and you could argue that you really don't want um, anything to coat uh, surfaces while you're trying to swallow it. Now, um, as I say, testing adhesion in a kitchen um, is extremely difficult. We've used a spoon tilt test here, where again, a spoon very widely available um, for minimal cost and available at the point of service. We're using gravity, again, as a, a weak force to pull that off and we can relatively uniform. We're also advocating a gentle flick. So this is um, undoubtedly introducing a certain variability, but we're trying to minimize that as far as possible. And the international guidelines on creating um, standards and specifications 
um, were clear that if there isn't an instrumental measure, then the next best step is to specify a standard protocol. And that's what this spoon tilt test is, a standardized way of evaluating um, the adhesion of a sticky, potentially sticky semi-solid. So um, though it doesn't give a quantitative measure, it does give a standard assessment technique. Okay, so in summary, our food textures relate to that degree of oral processing and are based on um, literature and studies from those uh, from that environment. Going from biting, chewing, moistening, till something's ready to swallow. And that covers the ITSI levels 7654. Now, a final point about how to use these measurements. Um, again, this is something that I repeat very often, but ITSI is a language and it's not a law. It's only there to enable conversations. Clinical judgment should be the first step. It's is just a tool. It's not a textbook for prescription. So um, please do be very careful about that and, um, and use it appropriately. But it can be used as um, a quantitative measure. And I, I like to think of it as an X scale that now facilitates the clinical research which we weren't able to access when we created the framework in the first place. So for example, we can use things like the functional diet scale to quantify somebody's rehabilitation process in terms of their ability to handle different levels of texture modification. All of these measurements, um, and this applies to all measurements in general, use them as appropriate. Think about what you're trying to measure and come up with a measurement that um, reflects that. So now um, a little final um, footnote about the science in front of IDSI. Um, and starting with our own peer reviewed publication in dysphagia, um, we were uh, very warmly commended by the editors um, for 17,000 downloads in the first year, um, which is a lot for dysphagia. <laughs> and if you search now, um, you'll, you'll see 80 citations of this. That's future work that's been done citing um, the IDSI publication, this particular one, um, on PubMed or on Google Scholar 305. So it's really great that that message is getting out there as a standard tool for dysphagia research. Using um, research databases to search, Google Scholar gives us over a thousand articles, PubMed um, 43 and Science Direct 90, just for a simple IDSI search. So clearly that's not going to, to cover everything, but just gives an idea that there's a lot going on out there. And just to pick a few of those, just purely to, um, to illustrate certain points. It's lovely to see um, a large expansion of research into paediatric dysphagia, which was sorely missing um, clinical research. But now, particularly with that quantitative um, measurement ability, we see um, a lot of that. So pureed foods, um, hard to quantify otherwise, but ITSI enables that. Milk flow through bottle teats, this is particularly interesting because when we created that framework in Vancouver, at the table, as well as those texture modified drinks, was breast milk. And the flow of um, thin liquids through tiny orifices is so relevant to particularly infants with failure to thrive. They're using a huge amount of their energy reserves to, just to feed. And if that liquid is too thick to flow through the teat, then that's that can be extremely critical for them. So that um, nozzle of the syringe is very relevant there. And transitional state foods, again, very difficult to think of a measure to um, characterize those unless you use the IDSI tools which are available. Um, implementing IDSI can be very challenging, but we have publications and documentation of that being done in a variety of settings now. So that can be used as part of the maybe the advocacy process to reassure um, those in charge, let's say managers and controllers, um, that there's evidence for ITSI uh, implementation. And we have um, other screening tools, for example, um, this one here, um, based on uh, ITSI and extensions to ITSI, the um, functional diet scale. 
it is also very um, widely used in assessing new products and therapies. And it's been so reassuring that um, from a situation 10 years ago of a huge variety of products um, on our table in Vancouver, the majority of um, foods and drink producers now have really come into a line and products labeled Itzy 1, 2, 3, 4 are consistent across different brands. So that's wonderful. Also looking at swallowing lubricants, um, just about everybody on the call, I think, wouldn't fancy swallowing a pill. So these lubricants are uh, becoming very desirable. But again, what are they? Well, you can use Itzy to characterize them. And um, items that are specific to geography, so soft fish-based pastes, can, you, can be assessed using the same tools that are available worldwide. And people can then compare that um, to products that are available locally. So all of the research builds up this clinical database. Um, I was privileged to be able to be involved in a study that um, looked at using IDSI techniques in extremely resource limited um, environments in rural South Africa. So again, the same worldwide standards of texture modification and measurements being used um, in a huge variety of settings. So that's very um, reassuring. And um, yeah, a very positive mes message from ITSI. So final note then is that I hope um, I've convinced you that we've taken science out of the lab um, and enabled it to be used by anybody on that page to keep uh, everybody there happy. <laughs> so that's the uh, end of my presentation and I'll uh, hand over to our hosts. I'll be very happy to take any questions that may have come in through the uh, chat as I've been talking. Thank you very much, Ben. What a great presentation. I'm sure that uh, the audience really appreciates you uh, bringing forward to us all of the scientific information behind the development of ITSI. I think uh, you've actually uh, been able to uh, enlighten us with, with the stories of uh, how ITSI has developed. So often uh, with publications, we see the technical information but we may not necessarily see uh, stories behind the technical information. So um, we would welcome uh, the audience now to ask uh, any questions. Uh, please uh, take a moment to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A and uh, we'll be happy to address those. I, I think I see a question, um, what temperature should I test at? Um, yes, that's a very um, interesting question because in some of the, the previous standards, the temperature was specified, um, very often 25 Celsius, um, which is a pretty cozy room. Um, I, I work in London, but my home's in Scotland where I am now, and not many of the rooms around here are 25 Celsius. But anyway, um, <laughs> more important than that is that that limits you to testing only room temperature products and um, most of the foods and drinks that we consume are not room temperature they're either chilled or warm and IDSI's philosophy is that you test what is being consumed so if something is designed to be consumed um, refrigerated you test it refrigerated and if something's designed to be um, consumed warm you test it warm whatever temperature that may be the tools enable you to actually track differences in consistency from chilled to room temperature to hot. Uh, and this is something that I've had some fun with myself measuring, for example, custard, um, which when it's chilled can be thick enough uh, to sit on a fork, uh, it's level four, but as you heat it up, it starts to become more runny, would start to dribble through the fork, becoming a beautiful ITZY level three. And if you're really heating it up um, on a stove or a microwave, that can thin even further to an ITZY level two. 
it's for, for that reason that we have never said, we've really shied away from recommending certain ingredients. People will often um, ask as well as a frequently asked question, what levels banana? Or what about avocado? Well, it depends what banana or what avocado, because um, the properties vary so widely. The same for mashed potato. It can be thick enough to choke somebody, or it can be a thin gruel if you make it wrong. So there's no um, relation to ingredients in the same way that there's no relation to, to temperature. You test what is being consumed. Um, I mentioned with the syringe test there that we, we chose 10 milliliters as being enough to sacrifice as a sample. And the same for the fork and spoon tests too. Um, I, we, think, we thought it was acceptable that you could take a fork full of somebody's dinner and test it. Even um, uh, so, even assuming that um, the fork is maybe not food safe. Now, in normal practice, you'd be eating with a fork or spoon anyway, so you can carry on um, eating with that. But um, yeah, we really wanted to um, be able to take a, a representative sample and just enable that testing at the point of service. Thank you, Ben. Um, we have a question from David who works in uh, a neonatal uh, intensive care unit and his focus is uh, around infants. So his question is, uh, I wonder if you could speak to the difference of fluid flow through the nipple of a bottle. Uh, one of the challenges that they've come across is comparing Verabar used in swallow studies and then providing recommendations uh, with regards to nipple flow. Mm. It's um, very difficult. Um, so Verabar um, will have some um, texture to it with uh, the barium particles, but they are, I would hope, a lot smaller than the, the orifice of that, uh, of that nipple. Um, the, the nipple size is gonna have a little bit of variation there too. So um, you might get variation uh, between products. Um, and the size is also gonna vary, I think, because it's uh, rubber or latex, it's gonna expand depending on the pressure that's applied. Um, so yeah, it depends on how hard it's being sucked really. You saw that these um, products tend to have a very non-linear relationship and that's very relevant here too. So um, typically you can tip the bottle up and nothing's going to flow out of it, but when you start sucking um, the liquid will flow and that flow rate is going to be again non-linear. It's not um, a case of doubling the, the suction, it gives you double the flow rate. Um, if the if the material's thickened, you're, it's very difficult to thicken um, barium contrast enriched liquids. So you're very likely to have a kind of texture in there too. And those lumps, um, they might be large enough to, to show up on our um, IDSI flow test, but um, the, the hole in a, a nipple is gonna be much smaller than our than our no nozzle too. So it's quite possible that blocking of the, the nipple hole um, will occur more readily than blocking of the um, IDSI flow test nozzle. Um, yeah, there are, there are lots of um, issues around that. Um, I don't know if there's a, a more specific point to go into, um, but I would just kind of, as a, as a general point, um, encourage as thorough mixing and as long waiting for the for any thickener to fully dissolve um, as possible. Um, the availability of pre-thickened contrast agents varies um, depending on where you are in the world as well, I'm, I must say too. So some people will need to thicken, some people won't. Um, yeah, so to try and ensure that that's as uniform as possible. Um, and yeah, the supply of, uh, of teats as well different suppliers will will vary too. Um, that's even without considering uh, sort of, what do they call it, uh, fast flow or cross cut. Um, yeah, uh, I um, empathize because that's a, a difficult challenge. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, and uh, David, thank you for that question. We can perhaps even bring that question forward. Uh, to a few of our pediatric specialists uh, on the ITSI board. 
um, and we can perhaps produce a, a, a feature on that uh, in a future uh, it's CE byte. We um, ben also have received a, a, a few questions. I'm going to cluster these together because I think uh, they speak more to people asking questions about um, what do you say uh, to those who insist on incorporating bread uh, in the quote itsy diets uh, or using uh, liquids that are thicker than should be prescribed. Um, and um, so things that, that you know, are variances or, or deviations from what was previously the national dysphagia diet. Um, so wondering if you could just address those, Ben. Okay. Um, well, firstly, a disclaimer that I'm not a clinician <laughs> before I get into trouble. Um, but yeah, there are some interesting points there. Um, I think the headline is that ITZY is a tool and not a textbook. So we're here to, to use, um, and the clinician should form their own opinion of um, a sensible and safe diet, and then um, make use of ITSI as a reference to that. So it's, ITSI is not exclusive, um, but it is a consistent reference. Now, um, in the ITSI framework, we highlight some of the challenges with using bread, um, that it can very, uh, well, has been shown um, to cause a choking risk in many cases, but not all. So the, there is a risk there, but again, it's up to the clinician. And there's no, um, as I mentioned, ingredients, there's no such thing as, as bread. There's a huge variety from brioche through to uh, crusty rolls, granary, all sorts of different types of bread. So there's no way that we can say that bread is um, allowed or not allowed. Yeah, um, thanks, Ben. It, it varies, yep. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, just to add to your point, Ben, um, a lot of people are trying to equate uh, the diet prescription that was previously used in the uh, national dysphagia diet, where we were talking about diet levels. Um, but what we're hoping people will understand is that with ITSI, um, we're talking about the description uh, and not a prescription. So um, it definitely will depend on the clinician's judgment uh, as you do your clinical assessment of the individual's abilities. And um, ITSI is there as a tool to help you match um, the food textural properties or the liquid thickness flow uh, to uh, help support or facilitate that person's abilities. Um, so we, we hope that people can understand that that whole paradigm shift or, or perspective shift that's required uh, from whatever national or regional terminology that you've been using to the use of, of ITSI. Um, ben, there was a question here from, from Tagba about um, the importance of the shear rate, which is usually stated at 50 uh, reciprocal seconds. Um, do you think it's reliable to use 50 reciprocal seconds to match the sensory assessment? No. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In the interest of time, um, no. It's, um, foods and drinks are complex, and it's just like people are complex. And somebody's anatomy, um, like their, um, their, their BMI or their, their waist measurement, doesn't fully characterize an individual. Each measure is, is one dimension of, of a person or of a food or drink. And testing everything at 50 reciprocal seconds is okay as long as your diet is restricted to one product. So maybe that's um, one ingredient of um, a thickener in one type of liquid. But when you start mixing in things like milks or fruit juices, or um, jellies, sauces, custards, and things, they're different, as I showed with, um, with gum thickened liquid versus an oral nutritional supplement. Now, we've done studies where um, we've matched two different types of liquids like that at 50 reciprocal seconds. Um, and if you measure at a different shear rate, which might correspond to maybe taking a sip from a cup, they're entirely different. So they really do behave differently in different ways. The illustration there is to think of honey on a fork. That's 
pouring off, but you can get honey that's got the same viscosity at 50 reciprocal seconds as the yogurt that I showed on screen there too. And they're, they're not the same where it matters in the mouth. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Um, I know that we're past the top of the hour. There are still a few questions um, that, that have come in. Uh, many of them have to do with, you know, can this food work for this level? Um, so rather than focusing on those, we would encourage uh, the people who have asked those questions, please go back to the ITSI website, take a look at the testing methods that we have recommended for each of those textural levels um, and use those uh, to try to answer those questions. Um, perhaps, Ben, we can just ask, uh, you know, one more question here. Um, and that is um, the, the question from, from Jin Sha. Uh, when you're using different uh, solvents or liquids, orange versus milk, uh, do you vary the time for stirring? Oh, um, yes. <laughs> Another easy to answer question, yes. It, it depends on, um, on what you are mixing it with. But as always, the, um, the answer is you do the test. Um, if you think something's varying or if you think something's different to another product, test it. Um, we're not the experts. The idea was to put the scientific tools in your hands. Um, so yes, I think the manufacturers of thickener products will say they'll provide guidelines just in the same way as um, as the producers of ready meals and um, you know oven cooked dishes say cook at a certain temperature for a certain time this is a guideline and your own local conditions may vary every orange juice is different um, so you can't just say with orange juice mix it for 30 seconds but with milk mix it for 45 or a minute it's always going to vary and that's normal because we're interested in interesting foods and drinks the answer yeah. is to, to do the tests. Absolutely. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think that, you know, unfortunately, our, our, our times come to an end. Uh, ben, thank you once again for, for sharing your amazing wisdom uh, with the audience. Kevin, I'm going to pass this back to you, please. Great. Excellent. Well, just to round out today's presentation, uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. As Peter mentioned, questions around specific foods and levels, uh, we will refer you to the resources on our website at iddsi.org. Also, keep an eye out on future eBytes. Um, that marks the end of this webinar. Before we go, a reminder that a recording will be available. And if you know of anyone who would benefit from listening to the recording, please share it with them once it's available. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hansen and Peter, uh, for your very informative and interactive presentation. And thank you, the listeners, for joining us today. Uh, we hope you found this information useful in your practice, and we'll be signing off. Have a great rest of your week, and until next time, bye, everyone. Goodbye.